If you've ever looked at a map of southeast Queensland, you might never guess that beneath those rolling paddocks and granite hills lies the eroded scar of a cataclysm so enormous it rivals Yellowstone and Topor. It's called the Mungor Caldera, and though few Australians have ever heard of it, it was once the stage for one of the most violent volcanic events our continent has ever known. Today there's no steaming lake or rising dome, no fumaroles or geysers to hint at its fiery past. Instead, the land wears a cloak of quiet, Cattle graze where magma once churned. Farmhouses sit where incandescent clouds once roared. But 220 million years ago in the late Triassic, this peaceful part of Queensland tore itself open in a super eruption that may have not only changed the face of Eastern Australia, but the planet itself. But first things first, location. Finding the Mungor Caldera was a tricky little bugger, but I managed to find it after doing some geological sleuthing. Firstly, keep in mind that the land has changed after this caldera erupted. The Mungal caldera was sliced by the Perry lineament, which offset its eastern third about 8 kilometers northward. This has warped the one circular shape of the caldera. Thankfully, geophysical tools can be used to help picture the size and scope of this massive structure. When viewed under gravity, we can see two circular shapes. Remember how it's been offset by 8 kilometers on its eastern side? That's this region here. Before it was warped by subsequent tectonic events, it would have fit snug to its western portion. Another thing we see are ring faults, radial structures created by the caldera collapse. But what allowed me to really zero in on its location is this layer which represents a granite called the Mungal granite. The alteration that occurred to the land not only distorted the shape of the original supervolcanic caldera, but it also created pathways for mineral rich fluids that still define much of the gold copper exploration belt there today. To understand how Mungal came to be, we need to step back in time before the dinosaurs we know from Jurassic Park even existed. In the late Triassic, around 221 million years ago, Australia was still welded to Antarctica and other fragments of the supercontinent Gondwana. The eastern edge of the landmass, what geologists call the New England Fold Belt, was a restless place, a patchwork of island arcs, oceanic crust and continental fragments that had been colliding and welding together for hundreds of millions of years. For much of the Paleozoic era, this part of Australia was a subduction zone, a bit like modern day Chile or Japan. An oceanic plate was diving beneath the edge of Gondwana, melting as it sank and feeding long chains of volcanoes along the margin. Those arcs built up mountain belts and each collision and accretion event left its mark in the form of folded rocks, thrust folds and granitic intrusions. By the late Triassic though, something began to change. The once compressed margin started to relax, the grinding subduction slowed, the mountains began to spread, and the crust started to stretch. It was the first sign of a transition from a compressional plate boundary, where plates collide, to an extensional one, where they pull apart. That shift would eventually lead tens of millions of years later to the opening of the Tasman Sea and the birth of modern eastern Australia. When continental crust stretches, it doesn't do so quietly. Deep beneath the surface, the hot mantle starts to well up, and new batches of magma intrude into the crust. Some of these magmas stall and cool to form granites, others, buoyed by gas and heat, push toward the surface, melting and mixing with the surrounding rocks as they go. The result is an enormous unstable reservoir of silicic magma, the kind rich in silica, capable of feeding catastrophic eruptions. That's exactly what was brewing beneath what is now the Mungor region of Queensland. The first signs of the Mungor system were relatively gentle. Rhyolite domes oozed up through the surface, solidifying into glassy lava mounds. These were the heralds of something much bigger to come, the early vents that marked where the crust was beginning to yield. Beneath them, a huge magma chamber, perhaps 10 or 15 kilometers across and several kilometers deep was assembling. It wasn't a single, tidy body of molten rock, but a mush of crystals, melt and gases. A simmering stew connected to deeper basaltic intrusions that kept it hot and buoyant. The magma itself was rhyolitic, a sticky, silica-rich composition produced by melting and remelting of andesitic crust with a pinch of basaltic input from the mantle. Pressure built for perhaps tens of thousands of years. The chamber ballooned, and cracks propagated upward. When the roof finally gave way, it wasn't a single vent that opened, but an entire region that failed catastrophically. Imagine standing anywhere within 100 kilometers of the caldera when the eruption began. The ground would have convulsed as magma punched its way through, blasting apart the overlying rock. Columns of ash and pumice would have climbed tens of kilometers into the stratosphere, spreading out like giant mushroom clouds. Lightning would have laced through the darkness, igniting fires in the forests below. The size of the caldera alone is 50 kilometers by 35 kilometers, 
and it tells us we're dealing with something on the order of 1000 to 2000 cubic kilometers of erupted material. That's the range of VEI-8 events, the largest eruptions known in Earth's history. For comparison, Yellowstone's last super eruption released about 1000 cubic kilometers, and the Topor eruption in New Zealand about 1170 cubic kilometers. Mungo's eruption either matched or exceeded them. Ash clouds would have blanketed the sky across the Triassic landscape, burying everything in their path. The surrounding basins would have filled with searing ignimbrite bright flows, pyroclastic surges so hot and fast they traveled at highway speeds, vaporizing forests and boiling lakes. These flows welded into dense, glassy rock that we now see preserved as intracaldera quartz ignimbrite, found interlaid with bedded rhyolite breaches inside the old volcanic basin. The eruption likely lasted days to weeks, cycling through phases of column collapse, fountain-fed flows, and caldera collapse. Each phase would have emptied more of the magma chamber, causing the land above to sink further and further. A volcanic winter inevitably followed the eruption. When a magma chamber that size is partially drained, the crust above it can't support its own weight. It collapses, sometimes gradually, sometimes catastrophically, along ring faults that encircle the chamber like the edges of a giant piston. That's exactly what happened at Mungor. As the eruption raged, sections of the crust sagged inward by hundreds of meters, then kilometers, producing a vast collapsed cauldron. A 50 to 35 kilometer ovoid depression orientated east to west, cutting across the region's older north to northwest structural grain. The fault-bounded margins of the caldera were marked by ring dites of porphyritic biotite granite and rhyolite, some up to 200 meters thick, intruded along the collapsing edges like molten stitches holding the wound together. In the aftermath, the center of the caldera was a wasteland, a steaming ash-filled depression kilometers deep, ringed by shattered fault scarps and domes of still-cooling lava. Inside that depression, enormous quantities of hot ash and pumice continued to pour in, accumulating to thicknesses of perhaps a kilometer or more. These layers welded into the massive intracaldera ignimbrite sequences we see today, sometimes intruded by younger granites that represent the lingering heat of the system. After the main eruption ceased, the magma chamber didn't go cold right away. It refilled, partially, with new magma, a process known as resurgence. The floor of the caldera began to dome upward again as molten granite pushed its way back into the base of the depression. This produced a body of weakly porphyritic biotite granite, texturally homogeneous and chemically similar to the rhyolites that erupted earlier. Geologists interpret this as a resurgent pluton, the frozen heart of the volcano as it tried, unsuccessfully, to come back to life. And this pluton is actually visible when using gravity images. You can see two domes where magma attempted to reach the surface. It's little things like this that really leave me awestruck and that remind me of why I'm so fascinated by geology. We get to not only peer beneath the surface and see the caldera shape, but the places where, post-eruption, this caldera struggled to stay alive before finally giving in to its demise. So, by this stage, the supervolcano was effectively dead. The eruptions had spent their fury, the remaining magma congealed, and the once towering volcano collapsed into itself. Rain and wind began to slow patient work of erosion, carving valleys through the tuff and granite. Within a few million years, vegetation returned, life crept back across the scar, and the caldera faded into geological memory. It turns out that the Mungo supervolcano didn't just leave behind ash and granite, it also left behind metal. Today, more than 200 million years after the eruption, geologists and exploration companies are combing the same hills, searching for traces of gold, silver, copper and molybdenum. ActiveX Limited, one of the companies working in the region, holds permit rights over the old caldera margin where the ancient Perry Fault Zone cuts through the volcanic and granitic rocks. That fault, the same one that helped Mungor's magma reach the surface in the first place, still marks zones where mineral-rich fluids once surged upward through the fractured crust. Those fluids cooled, crystallizing veins of quartz laced with metals. What survives today is subtle, but to the trained eye, unmistakable. The Mungor complex forms a broad, elliptical zone of granites, rhyolites, and ignimbrites, their textures and chemistries revealing the fingerprints of that ancient cataclysm. The region also preserves a second volcanic structure immediately adjacent to Mungor, a cluster of rhyolite domes and a broad regional sag. Some researchers believe this may represent a second caldera, formed by a companion eruption in the same magmatic system. Together, the pair mark a volcanic province of staggering proportions, a field of rhyolite and granite that once must have rivaled the volcanic plateaus of New Zealand and Western North America. The irony of Mungor is that, unlike Yellowstone or Topor, it's been so thoroughly eroded and buried that it almost escaped unnoticed. 
There are no dramatic cliffs or giant cold era lakes to portray its existence. For decades it was simply mapped as a granitic complex. Only with detailed geochemical and structural work in the 1990s did geologists realise they were looking at the remains of a collapsed caldera system, and not a small one. So in every way that matters, size, structure and eruptive sequence, Mungo fits the template of a VEI-8 supervolcano, the largest volcanic eruptions known to exist. But because the deposits are deeply eroded, and no direct ignimbrite volume has been measured, geologists still refer to its eruptive output as unquantified. Even so, by comparing it to similar sized calderas, a reasonable estimate of 1,000 to 2,000 cubic kilometres of eruptive material fits perfectly, enough to blanket half of eastern Australia under metres of ash. Because of this, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that Mungal was a global scale volcanic event. Today, if you walk along the old quarries and road cuttings near Gainda or Mount Perry, you can still find the relics. Welded ignimbrite with flattened pumice fragments, rhyolitic breaches with shards of volcanic glass, and granites that once crystallised kilometres below the surface of the eruption. Every mineral grain, quartz, feldspar, biotite, tells part of the tale. So next time you hear about Yellowstone's restless magma or Topor's explosive past, remember that Australia has its own giants. They're just older, quieter, and hidden beneath the dust of time. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.